Jeff Carlson takes control of your digital photos for the third time. This is Mac Voices. Today's edition of Mac Voices is supported by the Mac Voices Dispatch, our weekly newsletter that keeps you up with everything Mac Voices is doing. From our published episodes to Chuck's other appearances to special events and more, subscribe at macvoices.com slash newsletter and stay fully informed so you don't miss a thing. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, you know I love to take, talk to Take Control authors because I have such a high regard for everything they do and for just the people that they are in general because they are the experts in whatever they write about. This time we're going to touch on one, though, that I think applies to pretty much all of us. If you're an iPhone owner, even if you're not an iPhone owner, you are probably inundated with photos because it seems like there are cameras everywhere now. That's why you want to hear from Jeff Carlson, who is the author of Take Control of Your Digital Photos, 3rd Edition. Jeff, welcome. As always, it's great to see you. I know we'll get some some really great information out of this. <laughs> Thanks. It's always, always good to be here. Um, yeah, so I, you know what you said just there, um, being inundated with photos, it's funny. Uh, I, I realized when I was updating this book, so th this is the third edition of this book, and this actually marks 10 years since the first edition. So wow. this is like, like, like I've been writing this book for a decade. And at the time, so 10 years ago, you're like, oh, 10 years ago, that probably wasn't much of a big deal. Maybe we had a few digital photos, uh, but no, of course we were sort of swimming and being inundated with photos 10 years ago. And that problem is just compounded over the last decade because now, like you said, more people have iPhones, more people are taking more pictures with iPhones. And then you also have, you know, you probably have a mirrorless camera or maybe a DSLR. And like all of this just keeps adding up and we find ourselves. And it, w what's funny is my, my first reasoning for doing this was just that I, people were just running into having too many photos. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't so much that you had so many photos. It was that you didn't really have time to do anything with them. So you'd go, you'd take a whole bunch of photos and that's great. You went, maybe you went on a, like a, a, a weekend vacation or something or uh, an event with your family and you take all those photos and that that's great. Now you have those memories. What are you going to do with them? And the thing that comes up most often is the time that it takes to do anything with them. Because you think to yourself, I'm going to go look through those, or I'm going to organize those. I'm going to put them into Lightroom and I'm going to add keywords and all of this stuff. But it all takes time. And then you don't get to it. And then you go take more photos. And so it just builds and builds and builds until you get to the point where you know you've got good photos in there somewhere, but it's exhausting to think about having to go and find them or to organize them. And then you run into a situation where you do need to find something and it takes way too much time to do. It's difficult because you're then trying to remember, all right, I think I took this photo on a weekend. It was during the summer. And then you just sort of scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. What's funny is I've said this, I'm, and you know, we, we, we've talked about this when I've talked about the previous editions of the books and it's a problem that's still there. And I think it's a problem that just keeps getting bigger because we have so many different sources of digital photos. So, um, so basically when I approach this edition of the book, uh, which it hasn't been updated since 2019. Part of me was thinking, we're going to have to like throw everything out because certainly everything has changed. And it turns out that a lot has changed for sure. But a lot of the core principles in there still apply. And the idea behind the book is, here's a way to give you some strategies to organize your photos, not, not necessarily just the ones that you have, but also the ones that you are about to take 
so that after you take them, you can process them easily. And by process, I mean basically pick out the good ones and the bad ones so that when you do need to find something or you do say, I've got three hours on Saturday. I just want to sit down and I want to edit my photos. You can go and find the ones that are the most promising and the, the ones that you really wanted to edit and get to that and just get rid of all that time just, I don't know, churning through the stuff that you're not really going to spend much time on anyway. So yeah, so that's that. <laughs> that's yeah. the book and, the, and, and there's a whole bunch of new stuff in there and it's... Uh, here I am again. I'm, I'm amusing myself because here I'm again talking about the core problem, which hasn't changed, which is it's exhausting to deal with digital photos, but we all have so many and we all have to deal with them. And what do you do about it? And there's so many companies out there that are offering solutions of, of one kind or another. And so you're tempted to endorse or embrace one or two of those solutions, but even they take time to implement. So, yeah, we need a little guidance here from you as to, you know, what's worth our time and our effort, because there is no magic sauce to this yet. Maybe at some point, but not yet. Um, yeah. and, and plus the fact that now, and of course, I think, I think that we maybe do a little bit of a disservice to video, because now short videos are getting into the mix. And if we want to really get geeky, we can point out that live photos on your iPhone are basically little mini movies. So, yeah. you know, if you're not out there shooting feature length films with your iPhone, well, you still potentially have a little bit of a, of a video issue. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, where, where do you start, Jeff? I mean, when you, when you start to relook at that book, do you start with the services that are out there? Do you start by eliminating the things that are gone or maybe just aren't relevant anymore? Yeah. So, um, so some of that was trying to look for things that just didn't apply. And surprisingly, there wasn't a lot that I just, you know, was able to just toss out. I mean, there was one section that we removed that was all about converting an Aperture or iPhoto library to Lightroom um, just because there was a whole bunch of different steps to make sure that that happens correctly. And that was a bit dated. And actually now my recommendation is if you want to do that sort of uh, conversion, that migration, there's an app from a company called Syme or Seem. It's C-Y-M-E. They're a, a French company. And uh, there's an app called Avalanche. And Avalanche, it's really very cool. What it will do is do the conversion for you, but it uses a lot of of um, AI and machine learning to figure out how like your edit settings that were in Aperture or Photos or kind of whatever, it can convert between a lot of different things, how that applies to the settings in, let's say your destination is Lightroom. So it's not just you're going to get all your libraries and all your photos and just move them into another box essentially it makes it possible so that you can preserve your edits maybe not exactly because these different programs have different ways of you know different you know tone controls and things like that but there's kind of the core basics of you know exposure saturation shadows things like that and it will then make those controls match as close as possible to what you had done before so you're not losing your edits or you're not having to like bake in your edits and then if you want to go back to it you have to start over again so that was that was a a nice realization that there's a tool out there that will do a lot of this for you but some of it was really just looking at um the core concepts that i put into the book about how to organize your photos. So for example, I'm a big, and I say this sort of hesitantly because I know that I, I'm, I'm going to sound like a dinosaur, I'm a big proponent of using keywords. And I say that, I know, nobody uses keywords. I have an editor who has never keyworded a single photo in his life, and he's an amazing <laughs> photographer, right? But 
there's there's definitely value in being able to tag your images to make them much easier to find later. Well, okay, the reality is yes, that's helpful. And for people who do like to keyword and you know do want to keyword in a much more detailed way than I do, you can go into something like Lightroom Classic and you have different hierarchies and I mean you can go crazy. But the reality is most people don't do that. And the companies that are working on all the software, they know that. So there have been a lot of things that have come out over the last, you know, four or five, uh, six years where you're using um, things like AI to recognize objects and scenes in images and make things searchable based on that. So, for example, you know, in Apple Photos, in uh, Lightroom Desktop, not Lightroom Classic, um, I'm trying to think of some other good examples, you can do a search that has, you know, no keywords were ever involved. You can say, you know, show me um, a picture of <laughs> pictures of coffee, and it based on what the machine learning knows about what coffee is, you know, a cup, a maybe latte art, you know, colors, things like that, it will just bring up images that it has scanned in your library that that match that. So in one sense, you never really need to use keywords because that is something that, that these software programs are offering. But there's a catch. And the catch is, uh, especially with, say, Apple Photos um, or Lightroom Desktop, um, it's doing all this work for you, and that's great, but it's all really behind the scenes. You don't have any control over specifying what is what. So if I want to, say, find um, winter scenes, I want pictures from winter, and it, that will pretty reliably come up with you know, pictures of, of snow, snowy trees, maybe snowy landscapes. Um, it knows just what you know, quote, winter looks like in various capacities. But it'll also come up with maybe a black and white photo that I shot of a, you know, stone um, uh, mountain or, you know, hillside that's not necessarily snow, but the software reads that because it's mostly white, because it's black and white. And that just, you know, shows up there. So, you're giving up a lot of control for, I think, just enough convenience that it makes it work. But that can also mean that you miss the image that you have in mind that you're trying to find because the software's AI didn't think the way you did about that image, if that makes any sense. So, I, go ahead. I, yeah, I mean, I think that makes perfect sense because that's that kind of individual bias is something we all bring to pretty much everything in our lives. So mm -hmm. if if I think of, oh boy, if I think of a ball, is it a football? Is it a golf ball? Is it a basketball? Is it a baseball? There's no question it's all a ball, but yeah, you know, the, the, how does, I mean, AI has to then be specifically trained to go into that genre and say, okay, what kind of ball is it? Or is it a ball yeah. of fire? Or is it... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else, but you know, they're, a planet they're or of, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, they're all kind of you know. You're right. Yeah, if I take a picture of Saturn, is, is that going to be described as a ball yeah. or not? Or are you going to get a party where people are dressed up and dancing? That is also a ball. There you so go. you know, like like and and part of this is that because this is its own little lockbox, um, you can't help to train it. You can't say, oh. I was looking for ball and it came up with party, but this is not what I mean. So, you know, mark this as not ball or something like that. Um, and so it's, it's absolutely helpful. Don't, don't get me wrong, but it frustrates me that, that it's, it's, it's just so opaque. So in the last couple of years, we have a couple of other alternatives. And so one of the new chapters that I wrote in the book is working with, um, uh, working with ways to to do keyword tagging using AI that's more than just what the software is is providing. 
So there's a there's an app called On One. I have to get this right. On One Photo Keywords AI. Um, keyword photo photo keywords AI. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's in the book. Um, and uh, there's. The, there's also a, there's another app called Xire Photo, E X C I R E, and what these do are basically what I was just describing. They scan your images and determine what's there, and they t- determine characteristics of your images. But they actually build keywords that you add, or that they can automatically add, so that you're not just you know, hoping for a nebulous, does this match winter kind of a thing, you go in and you see, ah, this says that this is a snowy scene and it recognizes that it's daylight and maybe it'll put in winter and maybe it'll say, um, you know, a person with a hat or mittens, things like that. Uh, whatever it, it can see, it builds actual keywords for. And then if you want, you can go through and, and cut some of those out. Um, the on one photo keyword is, is really cool, but it tends to be a bit uh, too detailed. So like the, the, there, there's some pictures that of, of people and it'll say like human arm. And uh, you know, <laughs> like I will never be searching for a photo looking for the keyword human arm. I'm sure it's helpful that it's there, but at the same time, I'd rather have more data than less data, right? So part of of what's new in this book is how do you take this, which is sort of fundamental to a workflow of building keywords and, and having them available with your photos, how do you build that into your workflow of capturing images and processing them and organizing them so that's it's it's super cool it adds kind of another little step but if you're someone who likes keywords or wants to just let the machine do it let the computer figure this out for you um, it can save you a ton of time and a ton of energy later when you can just say ah i am looking for a ball that is red that uh, is, you know, uh, large or something like that. Um, there's also um, uh, another app that we can talk about in a different context called Peak2, also by the, the same company, CYME, uh, Seam, Seim. Uh, and what that does is it lets you um, build a bunch of, of, of different libraries together, but in respect to what I'm talking about right now, they added this conversational search feature. And it's basically doing what Apple Photos and Lightroom would do, but it's doing it, I find that those results are a little bit better. So for example, in the book I say, um, you know, I wanna find a picture of two people sharing coffee. And it came up with images of a couple that I photographed and they're in a coffee shop and they're drinking coffee. Now, when you break that down, two people, okay, that's not something that you would have as a keyword, but you'd probably have at, at, you know, as a person, but it's able to say, all right, like here's a photo with two people. It's not four people. It's not just one person drinking coffee. It's two people. And then you've got, you know, coffee so it, it you know picked that up because they had coffee cups but that that concept of sharing that's not something that i would have necessarily put in as a keyword because it's, it's kind of describing what's happening it's not like describing a thing and so it picked that up because the machine learning has a, a concept of what sharing can look like especially in this context which is super cool and super helpful I don't want to take us too far down this, but we'll go into just a little <laughs> bit. But it, it occurs to me that this is sort of like some of the the text genera- text to image generators in reverse. That you're yeah. you're feeding it the image and it's giving you the text of what it thinks it's seeing or what it is seeing, as opposed to you putting in I want to have an image of two people sharing coffee and have it generate something. So yeah. it fe- it feels like this is I mean this is good news both of those even the keywords is a huge step forward 
But if you have something that can apply the the uh, the large language models or the artificial intelligence or machine learning or take your pick, folks, as to what <laughs> term you prefer. Um, yeah. Because I always get somebody that says, "No, it's really not this; it's that." Okay, fine. Yeah. You know. The, well, it, if I if I interrupt, I ended up yeah. having to write a sidebar, basically saying, you know, like like what's AI and what's machine learning um, just because it gets used in so many different ways and people who are actually doing artificial intelligence research I think they tend to grind their teeth when people are like oh it's an AI feature and they're like it's not AI it's machine learning uh, so yeah like we're running into that now in our conversation and in all sorts of other conversations and writing about this because it's 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 coming up a lot more and now people are like well is it ai is it ml whatever so yeah um yeah. my so glenn uh glenn fleischman edited the this version of the book and he at some point ran into a, a, a you know a section and he's like wait are you talking about ai or ml and i was like all right i'm just gonna like hit the brakes right now. I need to write a whole new sidebar. Just let's let's get on the same page and make sure we're all talking about the same things. So sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, I can't believe I'm excited about a sidebar about AI. <laughs> no, no, listen, you're right because because yeah, inevitably, you know the you, I don't know whether it is the AI researchers or whatever, but people get. I mean, is it photocopying or is it xeroxing something? We both they both mean the same thing, but it, as far as result goes, but at the end of the day. The Xerox or the the, the non Xerox people can get a little testy about it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, but but this is this is all good news because all of these tools now are pushing us forward to giving us access back into these photo libraries that we are accumulating. And I mean, it it sounds like something I'm going to want to check into because, believe it or not, I mean, with all my photos, there's one particular photo that's in my head. I know it's in the library somewhere, and I cannot find it. And this is mm -hmm. years and years back. So every once in a while, I'll, I'll sit down and say, I'm going to find that photo. And I never do. I know it's there. I just, you know, so yeah. maybe I'll, I'll tap in th this and see if it can help me find that photo. Yeah, but exactly. It, it, it's, it's, I, I love the fact that we, we haven't, and, and we will get to it, I think, you know, about ingesting your photos or organizing your photos or whatever. You know, now we we have tools that actually can help us do this, and not take up you know all of next week. Right, right, right. Well, so let's touch there on on you know you wanting to find your your image that that you know. Um, so part of of what this book has always been about is there's a big section that that's all about choosing an app or choosing a you know a, an ecosystem that will allow you to do all these things and i have you know some criteria where you know like i think there should be some sort of keywording you need to have some way to rate or favorite your images things like that and so i go through several of the sort of bigger options um, and ultimately i ended up with um, Lightroom Classic for a whole bunch of reasons, but it also talks about Apple Photos because it's so prevalent um, and a, a couple of other options. What you find though is in that sort of platonic ideal, yes, it would be great to say, I'm gonna use Lightroom Classic and that's gonna be the only thing that I use and all of my photos are gonna end up there and everything is gonna be nice and neat and in one place and I'm going to be able to find everything right away and everything's going to be perfect. The reality is, and this isn't just because I have to do a bunch of testing and writing and all that. The reality is a lot of us have a bunch of different things spread out all over the place. So for example, like Lightroom Classic, most of my library is in like a big Lightroom classic library, but it's not my entire library. I also have other Lightroom classic catalogs for say, like um, commercial work that I've done, um, events that I photographed. Because Lightroom classic, you can have multiple catalogs, you can only just have one open at, at, at one time. Um, same with Apple Photos, you can have multiple Apple Photos libraries 
it just depends on you know which one you want to have open and the reality is mostly people stick with one because it can only sync with iCloud photos in one library but you might have an older aperture library or you might have you know a couple of older iPhoto libraries that didn't get converted or maybe we're on a different computer like all sorts of different possibilities here so when you say I'm going to go through and find that image. Well, you're not just doing a text search in Lightroom because it may not even be someplace that Lightroom knows exists, or it might be on a different drive somewhere, or you were, um, you know, in a hurry and you had to create a new catalog when you were on the go because you didn't have your iMac with you, and th like all these different things. And you end up with the problem, even if you are someone who keywords regularly and you are you know, good about rating your images and all of that, they're still so, sort of spread all over. And that's where something like Peak2 comes in. Um, like I, I mentioned specifically like its search capability, but the real strength of Peak2 is that you can open and have accessible all of these libraries in one interface. So I can say, here's my main Lightroom Classic library. Here are the libraries that I use for the last couple of events that I photographed. Here's my Apple Photos. Here's an old Apple Photos that was iPhoto before it converted to photos. Here's an old Aperture library. Here's a uh, Capture One library that I have when I was testing Capture One. Um, here's uh, you know, a, a big old folder on a hard drive that is just a bunch of photos that got stuck there. And it treats them as a large library, but it still keeps them separate. You don't have to migrate. You don't have to convert. It just lets you have access to all of their metadata and search all that stuff. So you have it all in one place, which I think is super valuable for those of us who, you know, despite our best intentions, despite even, you know, writing a book about it, there's still images all over the place. And every once in a while, there's the one, you know, like, I know I have a photo of my old office mate that was super cute. And, you know, I've just, you know, bumped into her and I want to send it to her. Well, that can be a two minute search or that can be 45 minutes of hunting and then you're like, ah, forget it. I'll just, you know, wave or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I didn't expect the conversation to take the turn it has, but I, but I like this because these are real world problems. Um, and, and especially for someone like you who, who has a mirrorless camera and who has an iPhone, in fact, you probably have more than one mirrorless camera. So, you know, you can end up with multiple libraries. The rest of us may not have that same problem, but we may have the issue of older libraries. You mentioned Aperture, um, the whole way back mm -hmm. to Aperture, um, or Apple Photos libraries, or maybe we sent stuff up to Flickr for safekeeping. Um, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of different options here, and trying to figure out how to get those back how to get them all kind of to gel together is is a challenge. Yeah, yeah. I, I touch on this a little bit, but like like with Apple Photos, for example, I thought of another example, um, is Apple Photos is really designed to be just the, the big mega library, and, and that's great. Um, but the one key thing about it is if you are using iCloud Photos, so you can have your images on your, your phone and your iPad and maybe another Mac, whatever, um, it can only do that with one library. If you say, no, I want to sync this with a different library, then it's like, no, no, no you can't do that or you can do that, but then you're going to lose track of all these and it, it, it's kind of a mess. Well, what I think some people are doing is... So the problem with having a big uh, photos library is that your iCloud plan may not have enough storage for all of that. And so maybe you want to upload more photos, but you don't necessarily want to spend more money every month just for more cloud storage. So one possibility is you can 
um, you know, set a new photos library as your iCloud photos library that, you know, sort of keeps things under, um, say, you know, 50 gigs or I can't remember what the, what, I think maybe a, there's like a 200 gig tier. I can't remember off the top of my head, but anyway, um, or you are taking old photos and moving them out so that your newer photos can then be accessible on your devices. There's a, there's an app called Power Photos, which um, I've included in the book before. And it's really good about managing all these multiple libraries so that if you say, this is my main library, but I want to kind of have an archive that's still easy to access of my photos, let's say, you know, older than five years, this makes it a lot easier to make that happen. And that's, you know, I think a lot of people may not know that that would be even an option and they get stuck with the reality of, oh, well, I can't sync any more photos or now I need to go sit down and like delete a whole bunch of stuff and spend a whole lot of time getting rid of photos so that I have more storage space. And it's just frustrating and time consuming, but there are options and you can do things where you still keep your photos and you don't have to get frustrated and you don't have to waste a whole bunch of time. Our discussion with Jeff Carlson about the challenges of finding and using and organizing all of those photos you've been taking over the years continues next time as Jeff shares more tips, tricks, tools, and workflows that can help you do just that. That's next time on Mac Voices. We'll see you then. I'm Chuck Joyner. Thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.